Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you this evening. I'm Linda Grove Sponder, and this is my beloved partner and mover in the world, <laughs> Samuel Bonder. And we're here to present to you tonight the heart precepts of waking down in mutuality. And it's very exciting because many of you are very familiar with the 12 gateways of waking down in mutuality. But tonight we've actually, we're going to be introducing a little bit of changes here and there, primarily centered around the heart, which was really not spoken too much of in the earlier versions of the Human Sun Experience, which was the seminar that we used to teach and others used to teach back in the day. So tonight, once again, it is the heart precepts of waking down to mutuality, 12 gateways yeah. to radiant embodiment of the heart. So, um, yeah, the logo. <laughs> while Linda does her Vanna, <laughs> <laughs> we're actually, we're not going to be going into the precepts in detail. That's right. Uh, we're going to be giving a spontaneous, somewhat planned overview, uh, but we're going through the four different uh, arenas of the waking down and mutuality work, which in this uh, visual system are called triads, and also the gateways, the 12 gateways. So we will be going over them in some detail. So let me read a little bit of what we wrote just yesterday in a mailing that um, felt to us like it, it got at uh, what this event, actually, this particular presentation means for us and for the work. Uh, as well as more about what waiting down in mutuality and the heart are all about. So this, uh, this presentation will represent a next Dharma culmination, teaching culmination of more than a quarter century of bringing this work into the world. Waiting down in mutuality is a primary expression of what human beings go through when the heart becomes ever more self-aware in, as, and through each and all of us. This heart-generated developmental advance is not just taking place in a few spiritual practitioners. It's underway whole bodily in each of us and simultaneously in all of us, even all humanity, together. Each of the key principles and practices of this path expresses part of how the one great heart we all share is awakening, waking down in mutuality, is one of nature's primary ways of, quote, being, doing that evolutionary process. It's a way of consciously cooperating with the heart's own grace. What do we mean by the heart? The heart is at once the most intimate essence of everyone's feeling who they are, that same essence in everyone else and all other sentient beings, and even the essential nature of everything that exists. It is the ultimate mystery of all life, the totality, identity, all spirit and all matter, utterly precious to us and yet forever unknowable. The good news of this transmission and teaching to each and all is simply the sun in your heart is rising. Your essential nature is spontaneously intensifying, like the sun rising in the morning sky, except that the rising never stops and the sun's brightness always increases. So that being said, uh, and that'll be the last thing we'll read, by the way, in case anybody's <laughs> wondering if this is going to be a recitation. Other than just, you yes, know, one Yes, that's true. We do have little one-liners in each gateway. Yeah, but as Samuel was saying, that in the, the original teaching um, that goes with all of these points, there's m much more that we've written about and that's available, um, but not tonight. <laughs> tonight, we're actually, as Samuel called it, a celebration. It's a celebration of being with you, a celebration of over a quarter of a century waking down in mutuality, being in existence, and how many, many, many people worldwide have had what we call second birth awakening, which is conscious embodiment. We can talk a little bit about that in the waking down in mutuality um, triad and we're excited about presenting this to you tonight so once again the primary visual 
or mandala, if you will, that is the Waking Down and Mutuality 12 Gateways. The 12 Gateways are the sunrise, listening, waking, daring, the rot, transmission, down, recognizing the mystery, initiation, mutuality, and holding. And you'll see that all of those words are in, yeah, there we go. All of those words are in the mandala itself, which is a beautiful creation that Samuel and our friend Al Porter put together many years ago when we first started doing the human sun experience. So, let's meditate a little bit. Yeah, that's good. We're going to sit just quietly for about a minute or so, just so that we can all come into the room together, and then we'll proceed with the first gateway. All right, let's sit. Thank you. Okay. Let's move right on in then. So this is the first triad. I'll hold it up for you while Linda reads. So the first gateway, the sunrise understanding and relaxing into it. Second gateway, the rot, understanding and relaxing through it. Third gateway, the mystery, understanding and relaxing as it. And this full triad here is called three understandings or relaxations. And it's blue in part because blue is the color of the deeper mind, this deep indigo. And this triad calls us to a much more profound understanding of the nature of reality and of our own existence and potential. So, I think for me, it's important here to uh, get into just how central, speaking of the first gateway, this sunrise is to my whole life and work. And you know, I could go into great long detail, and many of you know that I, I have from time to time, but here's the essence of it. My spiritual quest began when I was about 20, but then a couple of years later, uh, I discovered a teaching and a transmission of a great Indian sage, whose presence ignited something in my heart of hearts. And it was in a part of my heart that I didn't know existed. I knew about the yogic chakra in the center, the spiritual heart, the soul heart. But this was in a place over on the right side of the chest. And I learned a lot more about that later, which it's not the time to go into. But the essence of it is that what happened in that incident in May of 1972 was that that center got activated very much by the sage's presence and blessing, um, even though he was no longer alive bodily. But it was clear to me he talked about this, and, and that was how it came about. 
And there was a sense of an infinitesimal brightness somehow deep within my chest there that shot forward and up just a little tiny bit. And the feeling of that center never left me and I became consumed, consumed by the quest to realize the fullness of the divine self on that basis and to bring that into life as fully as I could. And long story short, that's what I've been doing for the last however many years that is, uh, 40 odd, I guess. After about 20, that realization did come about mostly, or I would say, especially with the help of another great heart master or guru, uh, this one, an American teacher. Um, and then what occurred, though, was that I had to leave all of those teachers and teachings and find my own way. And when I did, that's when this, it's like I popped into place with that quality of presence, awareness, consciousness, and in a very embodied sense. And very quickly after that, it became evident that I was naturally radiating this kind of help to others. And that's what I've devoted my life to ever since. And lucky for me, one of the first people who grabbed hold of me and um, well, <laughs> socialized me, shall we say, <laughs> <laughs> was my beloved wife and partner, Linda. Uh, and we both, she fairly quickly went through all this herself. And we've yes, both been at this for a long time. And to come back to a key theme of today's presentation. In the early years of the work, that heart foundation, it spoke, that, that theme spoke to some people who became involved in our work and then became awakened and teachers themselves, but not most everybody. And it was only many years later, really in the last five, seven years or so, that we've begun to bring this forward. And at this point, in a way that, again, we feel is a cause for celebration. Yes, indeed. And it's great to start out with the sunrise, because as Samuel's pointing to, that is all about heart, all about the heart. And mm -hmm. quite often in one's practice or disciplines or even moving in the world, just living their lives, sometimes people feel a pressure or an energy or a heat sometimes, literally in the center of the chest, sometimes slightly to the right, where the sinoatrial node exists in the heart itself. And so I wanted to bring in a little bit of a story about that. My own personal experience in my awakening process many years ago was feeling a pressure in the center of my chest and occasionally on the right side. I literally felt it so strongly a, a few times that I thought maybe I was having heart problems in my early 40s. And I thought, how could that possibly be mm -hmm. so? But Samuel helped me realize that it was part of the unblocking and the part of the unfolding of the heart awakening, the literal heart awakening and expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting and with those moves with that energetic that haps, happens in the body itself it can have many different kinds of feelings just today as a matter of fact i was working with someone who was expressing a very similar thing that i experienced and samuel has spoken about it in his own process that pressure and it can also relate to releasing blocks in your system so that your being, your whole body, your cells are literally starting to resonate with a different way of being, the sun rising in your heart. Yeah, and thank you for also telling those stories. People often say to us, I, you know, I don't get what the heart is. Mm -hmm. Um, can you explain it more? And, and we try to, but when we speak of it here, the heart with a capital H, the sun with a capital S, what we're speaking to is that greater nature that is simultaneously most intimate to us and also 
it's as if infinitely distant or again unknowable so what winds up happening is that people begin to discover that there's something about that principle that way of characterizing the nature of the ultimate reality of all reality that starts speaking to them mm -hmm. another great story about this was there was a woman who was on residential retreat with us some years ago and she was doing very deep work and she was as i as best i can recall she was indicating there was something going on and and that was moving her and she didn't know exactly what it was and we said well can you say anything more about it and she said well it's the heart and when she said that she was surprised that the words had come out of her mouth she had not had a previous association of that kind yes but that was a moment where it wasn't just she was contacting the heart it was the heart coming alive and awake in and as and through her mm -hmm. and that's what we're seeing in this whole process so there's one other thing that i want to bring in just briefly at this point and we'll tap back into it as we go and that is that it appears that in very very ancient and more primitive times primitive by certain standards, but not without great spiritual intelligence, many, if not most people, had a much more heart-based sense of who they were. And that what appears to have happened over our historical growth is that as we've become more self-aware, we've also become in some ways dissociated. <laughs> our consciousness, our spirit, also our minds have become separated from matter and relationships and the rest of nature. We call that the spirit matter split. And one of the primary ways it's shown up for people is that we don't know how much our identity is based in and around our heads and our brains, our thinking minds, until this kind of process takes us out of that place. Mm -hmm. And that leads then to the second gateway. Yeah, so. taking taking that out of the process of the, the mental, um, sometimes people feel like they're stuck in their head, you know, right. but we have the words, the word dropping. And it's funny because the individual that I worked with today literally used that word, dropped, feeling like he's dropping down into his heart. And it's really powerful. Yeah, and this is, so when we talk about how this first part of the waking down and mutuality work, understanding and uh, relaxing, three understandings or relaxations, this first gateway is understanding and relaxing into the sunrise. But the way that happens is through the second gateway. And that's what we want to talk about next. Mm -hmm. So it is the rot. And what it is is understanding and relaxing through so you're understanding and relaxing into the sunrise by understanding and relaxing through the rot hmm. and linda will start us off with that one. yeah wow the rot there's so many elements to the rot and even just the word rot <laughs> connotes for some oh my gosh do i have to go through that and some actually do in a very minimal way and others go through the rot in a very dramatic, um, sometimes even seemingly severe way. But most of the time it's because your being is unleashing and, and relaxing and letting go of previous mind constructs, um, previous ways of belief systems that have worked for you through the years and then all of a sudden they don't seem to be quite working for you in the same way anymore so what happens is these things start to fall away they start to rot away and in that rotting something new comes in the new is a mystery we really don't know what the new is until we're actually living it and being it mm. but there's something about the rot that feels 
like it is a very important next movement in your being. It's not all bad. It's, it's not all painful or, or sad. It actually can be pretty exhilarating at times. When early in my process, I used to say to Samuel, I don't think I'm rotting. I, I feel like maybe I need to do something to bring the rot on because I know that's a step to the next thing. And he says, no, you don't have to go looking for the rot, my dear. Please don't do that. <laughs> but that's what it felt like. It felt like there was something that needed to explode open in my being. I had had, at the time, a really good job. I was living on my own. I was seeing Samuel as my teacher and my beloved, but I had my own place. Had great friends, you know, getting along great with my family. I'm from a big family. And yet all of those things didn't feel like they were enough for me. I always used to hold my belly and feel and feel like there was the void of something that needed to fill my being there in my belly. And so as I was moving in life, moving in my process, listening deeply to Samuel's teachings, going to the sittings in the early days, back in the early 90s to mid 90s, I realized that some of those things I clung to so desperately in some ways, some of my practices really did start to fall away. And I realized this feels like a natural way of being, and yet at the same time, it doesn't feel so good because these things are so familiar. And what do I do without them? Why is it that they're not working for me any longer? And once that starts to happen for certain individuals, there, once again, is a dropping down into more of who you are and more recognition of something is, is being birthed here. I don't know what the something is, but I have to stay open for it. I always like to use the phrase, hold open the possibilities of whatever that might be. Just hold open the possibilities. And as the rot process continues, new aha moments enter in, and that sure enough is what happened for me and many others. When I became a teacher many, many years ago, I noticed this was true for yeah. quite a few people. And one of the things about Linda's uh, way of going through the rot was that she, she's a good example of someone in whom it wasn't accompanied by extreme outward difficulties and challenges and and hardships uh as you were saying I mean, her life was really together in many ways uh, but nonetheless that the poignancy and depth of that sense of a void yeah. and you also called it a, you know, a separation a strong yes. sense of separation yes uh it wasn't that she failed to have moments of, of that coming about also. Yeah, that was further into it. <laughs> that was when I couldn't help but fall deep into the, the sensing of, oh my gosh, all I am right now is this core wound of separateness and confusion. This is how we spoke about it back in the day. Right. And I was miserable until a very dramatic shift happened that lifted me, you know, mm -hmm. ignited me out of my version of the rot. Something important to say about the rot, the rot shows up differently for each person. Yeah. Like I said early on, it can be extreme for some and it can be pretty minimal and not last very long for others. So as you're listening, <laughs> Just take heart and know that your process is very unique to you and find the, the skilled helpers and um, people to hold you and to help guide you through difficult times as you find, perhaps, in your life, things falling away. Right. Understand that the new is coming. Yeah, so we described the right, you may have heard of the dark night of the soul, which is a process in contemplative mysticism where there's a kind of falling away, an aridity, a, a sort of a, a desert 
of no longer having consoling spiritual experiences. And the result of that is that the mystic enters into a, a sense, a state of unity with the divine. But it's typically been conceived as the divine as spirit itself, apart from the world and our ordinary personal humanness, the ego, and so on. The rot is more a dark night of the whole being, we could say, that takes us into a different orientation to life, but one that ultimately does include quite profound unity, just of a different kind. Mm -hmm. And so that leads us to then the third gateway, the mystery understanding and relaxing as it. So let me use that term uh, core wound just a moment ago. And that was a phrase that I came up with very early on in my teaching uh, that has actually, the meaning of it has evolved for us over the years and even some of the ways we speak about it and, and a very central one that relates again directly to uh, this stage of the teachings evolution. The core wound is, is, in simple terms, it's the simultaneous knowing, feeling and knowing that we're mortal, that we're limited, that, uh, that we're very vulnerable in life, and sensing that there must be more, mm -hmm. that, that we can be much less limited if not somehow limitless ourselves. And so that, it, it, I've talked about it, written about it as a kind of the driving force of human evolution, uh, much more from my perspective than uh, biological facts, such as having opposable thumbs and being able to create tools and all that, and not to, dismissing any of that. But this seems to be what drives us more than any other species we are aware of to transform not only the world around us, but also ourselves mm. and Indeed. to keep on changing it in many ways so rapidly compared to other species. Yeah, you know, that place where you feel like something is, is missing, but you don't know what that is. You, you can't even really put your finger on it because it is so mysterious. And then as you're continuing to grow and evolve, and as I pointed out today in a, in a session with someone, we're constantly evolving and growing with every breath, every moment in time, there is something that is landing mm -hmm. in our beings and actually being sent out into the field, sent out into creation, into the world. And that being said, when we're going through a process of intuiting that there's more to us than just our personalities and our work lives and our families and friends and what have you, that, that drives us. That actually can make us into spiritual seekers because you're seeking for something that you feel and intuit is in you and as you but you haven't realized it yet so that mysterious movement keeps you going forward it keeps you going forward for another reason as well it's not just about self-realization it's not just about you it's about you yes being as whole and free and and in your body and in relationship in realization as best you can so that you can take that take yourself out into the world in service and the service shows up in many different ways for people as well and that's also part of the realization along the line for most people is that they find different ways to do their service whether that be being an activist on a global scale or being an activist at home taking care of your family or feeding your cat and dog or whatever it might be. All of these actions, all of these ways of being adds to that movement in the world. Yeah, so what then makes this particular kind of evolutionary activation possible is exactly rotting 
out of the spirit matter split, and this is part of what the sunrise of the heart is producing in us, we begin falling away from our previous ways of making things work and our hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work, I go, go get it of this. It's not that we lose those capacities, but we lose the we lose the will to try to change ourselves at the core. And as we are losing that, we start to fall into this quality, this sense of wound or dis-ease or distress, discombobulation, a sense of, as Linda was saying, the void. For me, as that was happening, I felt like there was a steel band around my chest that was cinched very tight. So there are often physiological sensations, not always, but often physiological sensations because we have never actually allowed, or to put it more developmentally, not like blaming ourselves, we've not been able mm -hmm. to relax into the way we start knowing the heart fundamentally first of all which is the sense of something wrong something not being right at the core it's hard to be you these are all ways we've talked about this core wound or just in the last couple of years i think it was the spring of 2018 it kind of popped out of my mouth during a gathering one day we could call it the heart wound with a capital h and part of the reason I like that is because when people think of the core wound, they tend to think of my core wound as being my own local personal wound. And it's true that we each register it in our own local and personal way. But it is the wound of that heart nature itself. And the more we fall into it, paradoxically, the more we begin to discover an intrinsic wellness that is simultaneous with it. We hear people talking this way all the time as they go through this process. Yeah. They'll say things like, I feel so blankety blank, <laughs> <laughs> profane phrases here and there, screwed up. <laughs> you know, uh, often, not everybody. Some people say, yeah, my life is fine, but... Yeah. This is difficult at the core. And yet, they'll say, there's also something fundamentally okay yeah. that's going on at the same time. And we've had people, you know, say that to us more and more recently. Yeah, I was going to say that. You yeah. know, the, the wound wellness equation, yeah. you know, that simultaneously, yes, there's the wound and yet paradoxically mysteriously you are also existing in a deep sense of wellness the simultaneity you know this this marriage between the two right. is undeniable and we've been hearing a lot of this lately from people so it's wonderful and and that's what you know for more than a quarter of a century now when people have awakened or become much more singular in themselves through this process, it's by going through that. Mm -hmm. It's by allowing themselves to first kind of hit that wound quality or, or be up against it, not know what mm -hmm. to do about it. And we'll get to the what to do later that you know, that's, that's in, starts in the second triad. But the main thing or a main thing we want to emphasize here is that that wellness does start percolating through. And that is a primary quality of that sun in your heart rising. It's a grace of the greater nature, your greater nature, the greater nature that is taking place. And one other thing just to emphasize briefly here is that this core wound or heart wound, this wound wellness paradox, that is what we mean by the mystery, capital M. That's not the same, the, the wound quality of it is not the same as your personal historical wounds. You know, so sometimes people will say my core wound, you know, for me, it's all about abandonment. And we'll say, well, that's probably 
more what we would call core issues, but the core wound is deeper. It is at that place of the juncture between your infinite or unconditional nature and all of the pieces of you that are the person that have the story and so forth, which we don't minimize, but we, we don't equate them. So the core wound, heart wound is of a different nature. It's a little tricky sometimes too to discern whether you are actually feeling a core issue or if you're dropping into the heart wound yeah. or the core wound from the past, the way that we described it. And quite often the two are meshed. Sometimes an issue will actually assist you to go deeper yes. into an existential angst in your being mm -hmm. that isn't really even about the issue at all. You, mm -hmm. you contemplate, you feel into the issue and you say, yes, there's that, but this is not about that. And so this is where skilled helpers can really help you discern and um, help you drop further into what the heart wound is about, yeah. which is a gateway, a very important gateway in conscious embodiment. Indeed. So thus we have the first triad, three understandings or relaxations, the sunrise, the rot, and the mystery. And now moving forward, my turn to uh, hold this thing up here. Oh, Yes. So now this is the, the triad, listening, transmission, and initiation. So this is the image. The second triad, purple. There's a kind of a royalty to this. Purple is a royal color. And part of that royalty is that each of these adaptations or exchanges are associated with many, many traditions historically over a long time. So the fourth gateway is listening, attuning to your whole being, to others, and to life. The fifth gateway is transmission, receiving heart force, giving of yourself. And the sixth gateway is initiation, templating heart-awakened wholeness in daily living. Yeah, I wanted to tell a story about a woman who I used to work with many, many years ago lived down in Santa Monica, an elderly woman. And we used to do phone sessions and she would tape record on a little cassette recorder our sessions. And she used to say to me as I'm teaching some of the, the Dharma, the principles of waking down to mutuality, she would say to me, oh, Linda, I'm so sorry, but can you repeat that again and tell me maybe in a different way because I'm just not getting it. And I said, oh, sure. And so I, along the way, would have to assure her that repetition is totally appropriate and okay. And it actually gives me the opportunity to give her many different examples and feeling senses of what any particular piece that I'm teaching or that I'm speaking about to her. Eventually, she started having the major aha moments within the teaching. I totally get what you're saying here now. Eventually, she did actually have her second birth awakening, her conscious embodiment awakening. And she was thrilled after being in a different practice prior to waking down in mutuality. She was in a practice for over 35 years where she gleaned some beautiful things, but never really had the awakening that her heart was saying she wanted, needed, and was seeking for. She would tell me in the sessions, the, the, the deep listening, this is the, the gateway we're talking about, listening. She would say, I'm hearing you, but I'm not really taking, I'm not really getting it. That's why I need you to repeat it again. And I said, of course, there's a very important aspect to deep listening. But listening in that context, yes, was about hearing the words, understanding what I meant by certain words, and I would explain it. But as we worked together, she realized that there was deeper aspects to listening. It wasn't just about listening with the ears. And I was telling her, listen with your whole being. And what I mean by that is every part of who you are. Open up your heart to receiving 
a communication, even if the mind isn't making sense of it. So open up as much of your being, your whole being, every part of who you are as best you can. She really started understanding that. And one, t one day we were working together and she said to me, after I was kind of speaking about listening with every part and uh, uh, listening to self, she says, well, I can't fully listen unless I'm listening to myself. So there's that piece as well in the mm -hmm. gateway of listening. The importance of not just listening to the teachings, um, communications, whatever it might be for you that sings to your heart. Yes, do that. Listen deeply to these profound teachings, whatever it might be. But also step back for a little bit and see how the body is re relating and taking in the information. Mm -hmm. That's listening to self. That's opening up your body to receiving the communication to the wisdom of what is being taught. And that is the wisdom of the body itself. That's another thing that I speak about quite often in my private work with people. The body has a very particular wisdom that sometimes the mind can't quite catch up to sometimes. So it's important yeah. to do self-listening as, as well as listening to others. As a matter of fact, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that very woman uh, at one of the first workshops that we did where we were presenting these teachings. Uh, at the time, we only had a few of what became the part precepts. At the time, we called them key points. Uh, and she wound up making a major contribution to the listening gateway because we started talking about listening to teachings and listening to the other. And she said quite emphatically, yeah. <laughs> and she was really- It was wonderful. You want to make very sure that we understood this, um, that she she knew she had to listen first and fundamentally to self. And so that is a major part of what we mean by listening. Given how much in my background I've, I've studied various traditions, I'm not a great scholar of all the sacred traditions and practices by any means, but I know, and it was certainly true in my training, listening was extremely important, has always been extremely important in order. You see, you're not just listening with your mind, and certainly in this process, you, you, you as the heart are listening, even if you don't know yourself as that yet per se. You don't, you don't quite have that self-awareness going. But what goes on in this process is also enormously benefited by the fact that we are understanding that our shared heart is awakening. So it's not only about listening to self and listening uh, to the other, what they have to say. It's also that the other, including a teacher or someone who's more advanced along the path, needs to be listening to you. And mm -hmm. that mutual listening yes. is what really makes that process uh, so catalytic in our work. Uh, it, it, because so much of it, you know, this is, it, it, it's not about becoming a soldier of fierce discipline. There's a fierceness to it, mm -hmm. but so much of this is relaxing into yourself and allowing your vulnerable parts to come out. We'll get into this more a little bit later in the, in the down gateway, especially. But when you are being heard, when, for instance, Linda said to that practitioner, you know, tell me more about what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. And when we do this, you know, this characteristically has happened with many teachers and students in our work where the student not only is listening to what's coming to them and sitting, you know, really feeling themselves whole bodily the way Linda was describing, but they're also then having the experience of having the teacher or the mentor or the facilitator 
or simply a more advanced friend in the practice, listening to them and also listening to things about themselves that have seemed to them to be maybe the enemy of their spirituality, the places where they're most hurt, most broken, most mm -hmm. vulnerable, in the deepest kind of darkness in themselves. Those parts need to be listened to yes. as well. So there is that yeah. mutuality of listening. Yes, indeed. We have a term called green lighting, which plays into what you just said, which we'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about later in another gateway. But that opening up and welcoming all parts is really important. Yeah. Thank so you. the next gateway then, uh, there, people, people say to us uh, often, they're getting into this, what's the practice? Mm -hmm. And it's not that we say there's no practice at all. We do somewhat discourage people from practices to try to get their, the core of their nature to awaken. We say to them, there are basically two main practices. One is listening in the terms we just described. And the other is what we cover in the fifth gateway, transmission. It's a primary aspect of how our shared heart awakens that's served in this process. This is a heart transmission sourced and generated and activated process. Mm -hmm. And some people are energetically very sensitive and they'll say things like, wow, I really felt the transmission in this morning's meditation. Other people, when they, particularly when they hear that kind of thing, they're thinking, uh, <laughs> I didn't feel anything. What's wrong with me? Why am I not getting it? How come I'm not feeling? And thankfully, we've helped some such people, many, begin to get that whether you can feel something happening or not is really not the point. The point and the evidence, actually, of transmission being received is much more, no matter what you're experiencing, you coming alive and awake with that much more confidence in who you are, that much more access to your greater identity, which may not have any feelings or sensations associated with it, including feelings and sensations in the heart, may not even have a sensation of a dropping or a coming down, which we'll talk about a little later. But this transmission process is also quite mutual. So when we talk about it here in the in the kind of basic description, receiving heart force, yes, whether you're having experience of doing that or not, but also giving of yourself. Again, sharing yourself, speaking about yourself, being of service to others, moving <coughs> your life, your spirit, your energy out toward others and the world. This tends to facilitate or, or further expedite the transmission activating in the greatest possible way mm. in and as and through you. And we sometimes talk about it being kind of like rather than a something coming at you or only something coming at you from another, which certainly is part of what's happening when we're gazing. You know, there, there is an activation that's proceeding, especially from someone who's deeply awakened and knows that they're in this kind of transmission mode all the time, really, but especially in moments of serving others. But it's also true that there's a quality of it where it's like uh, a tuning fork, you know, is struck so that that essential, fundamental and total nature gets a green light itself in both parties. And as with mutual listening, transmission is mutual as well. Mm. And both parties are benefiting by it and growing on its basis. It's certainly true in our kind of work. You know, there have been many forms of transmission. That's another key piece here. Uh, we don't know of any other school that has a general, we like to say kind of a <laughs> DNA of heart transmission that ours does, which is not to say that ours is better than any other or more important. 
it's not about that kind of comparison, but, but there are distinctions. Yeah, speaking to that, we really encourage everyone to use discrimination, d discriminative mind, you know, discern what is actually happening for yourself as you're moving in whatever practice or whatever um, discipline or movement forward in your life and spirituality and to feel into what your truth is, to feel into the fact that, as Sanya was pointing out, the transmission is also coming from you. Everyone is transmitting their being force. Everyone is transmitting who they are in any given moment. As you're very aware of, a lot of you, the aspect of gazing is a form that when we're eye gazing with each other, it is a being to being meeting. It's not just that the teacher or the facilitator is doing something at you, not at all, not in the practice that we do here in Waking Down and Mutuality. It is a being to being, an honoring of each other, a meeting and being met. Mm -hmm. And the facilitator teacher may be feeling very strongly your particular transmission, whether you're awake or not. It's funny because I was working with someone the other day and I was saying to him, I feel your transmission. This is someone who has not had the awakening at this point, but making a beautiful shifts and changes in his life. And I said, when we gaze and when we're together on Zoom, I can feel your presence. And I, I love having this time with you because I feel like we're meet, really meeting each other. And I'm holding space for you to be exactly how you need to be and who you are. So this transmission is an extremely important aspect of our process. And Samuel kind of alluded, transmission comes in, in many forms. Oh my gosh, you know, there's transmission coming from inanimate objects sometimes. Definitely transmission in nature. Mm -hmm. Your pets are transmitting their kind of joy and happiness in the ways that they do. Plant life, uh, all of these things are touchstones and things to remind us to bring that kind of joy, that kind of connection into our lives. And to consider as you're looking at a tree or looking at a beautiful flower, wow, this is really interesting that that particular creation is transmitting its beauty mm -hmm. in its own unique way. Yeah, so in the full expression of the heart precepts, of our work, we bring up with respect to transmission uh, the kinds of difficulties that can occur in interpersonal relationships where there are these qualities of intensification, transmission, mutual activation, and it can take us into some difficult places. And those in our work are not to be avoided, as we'll talk about more in a few minutes. But we just want to acknowledge that this is this is cutting edge stuff for most everyone who is working to consciously evolve and grow and make their greatest possible contribution and be the most benign presence they can be in the world. And while transmission is an extremely important aspect of that process, it's also one that can trigger all kinds of uh, challenges in us. And more and more, we learn that those challenges are not evidence that something's wrong, or that we're wrong, or there must be something wrong with the teaching, the teacher, the process, whatever, but they are evidence of coming to the next challenge that we learn to grow through mm -hmm. uh, by this kind of practice, this natural way of cooperating with the heart's own grace. Yeah, and that's where the listening and the deep discernment enters back into, you know, being able to feel into, wow, what is shifting here? What mm -hmm. is what is getting activated in me? 
even if it's ever so subtle, I always like to say, don't negate the subtleties, mm -hmm. but also don't negate the big aha moments. Let's also say. So. <laughs> yeah. And so transmission then is the second thing that we like to say to people, if you want to make a practice of something, there's two things. One is listening in this full, whole body, whole being, mutual way we described. And the other is transmission. Tank up on transmission and bring yourself into the presence of association with people who are living that and can be naturally radiating that to you so that your whole being is fed and nurtured by this. In fact, that was a beautiful thing. Uh, someone said yesterday, I did a long meditation uh, the other morning on, on the Zoom platform. And uh, there was a young man there who had not done any work uh, with us personally. He'd been involved with the Trillium Awakening uh, teaching, which is associated with us and actually came out of the work that I founded, went on its own way. But it's still fairly similar in many ways. And uh, at the end of the meditation, this young man said, wow, that could have, and it was an hour, 65 minute meditation. He said, wow, I could have, I could have gone on for another hour with that. It was so nourishing. And that's one of the primary qualities people get out of association with this transmission. Indeed. So the sixth gateway then is initiation. Templating heart awakened wholeness in daily living. And there's not all that much that we want to say about initiation here, except to make a couple of important distinctions. One is that in our work, Initiation is not a formal ceremony. It's not like you know, me saying to someone, okay, you've reached X, Y time. It's time for you to have the initiation into the blankety blank practice. We may wind up saying to people, I feel like it's time for you to consider engaging in this or that practice. But the, the initiations we're talking about in this work are more spontaneous events, they are transitions in how you are feeling and knowing yourself in the world and how you are capable of participating with others and with life. And sometimes those initiations actually uh, come through difficult passages so that you know, you'll feel like, wow, I just lost it. I don't know where my practice went, whatever. And you go to someone who's helping you with all this, and you tell them that ruefully, feeling badly about yourself. And they'll say, well, I know it's hard to believe, but this sounds like progress to me. This sounds like you opening up to the next level of what needs to be integrated, understood and integrated, relaxed into and integrated in your whole life. So initiation then is the third of these three qualities of adaptation and exchange that go on in our process. Anything that you want to add to that? Um, the, the word templating yeah. comes in. Yeah, yeah. And part of the importance about that word templating is it kind of goes back to some of the other gateways that we're talking about, listening and transmission, um, certainly. And that is a mutual templating off of each other, you know. So in other words, when you're with someone and you're feeling like you're really understanding that person and you feel met and heard by that person as well, there is a, a meeting. There is sometimes an initi initiation into that meeting with the other person in mutuality, which mutuality is something we'll be talking about in a moment also. But there's a, a, a resonance. That's what I mean. That's what we mean by templating. It's templating off of each other. Mm -hmm. It's playing off of each other. It's opening yourself up to their being and what they're communicating and them doing the same, you know, templating off of each other. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, people understand these principles uh, intuitively and very deeply. Everyone who's had a mentor or a coach, everyone who's been a parent or had a parent, 
that they were able to learn from. They weren't just learning things. They weren't just learning skills, teachers of various kinds. They were also templating upon that person's whole being, yeah. their confidence, their understanding. And so I'm glad you brought that term in because it is central to our understanding of initiation. Mm -hmm. So that then finishes off our second triad, three understanding, uh, excuse me, three adaptations or exchanges, uh, listening, transmission, and initiation. And now we move on then into, in some ways, the heart of this heart process. Yes, indeed. The third triad. This is in red. And this is the three principles or embodiments. So Samuel will hold up the mandala. And this is the primary one, basically waking down and mutuality. And very important. So the seventh gateway is waking. Awakening as the heart of conscious identity in self-other realization. The eighth gateway is down. Awakening as the heart of bodily and psychic psychic identity in self-other realization. And then the ninth gateway is mutuality. Awakening as the heart of relatedness in self-other realization. So this is juicy. <laughs> I love this triad. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is the one that contains the three great principles of the work. And we call it three principles or embodiments. Yes. And it's red because red is the color of earth. And it's also a downward facing triangle, which for those of you with any association with the divine feminine, that's also the primary signal of the goddess, the primary symbol. The, or I like to call her the she mystery. And there certainly is for many people that kind of magic uh, associated with this work, which leads really actually to an important point here, not immediately with any of these uh, uh, gateways, um, but people go through waking down and mutuality in totally unique ways and have often wildly different orientations. So for instance, for some people, they're much more, even though they, they do wake down, they don't stay stuck in the head center of identity gravity, we call it, but nonetheless, they're more kind of secular in their orientation, scientific, analytic, intellectual. Other people are very, very heartfelt and may have profound devotional openings, uh, sometimes to another person, a teacher who's actually serving them, also sometimes and sometimes both at the same time with one or another traditional divine archetype, a god or a goddess figure, or certainly was the case for me, there was a mountain here in uh, the North Bay, north of San Francisco, Mount Tamalpais, that was quite magically and mysteriously important for me. So just wanted to make that point before we go further in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so waking, the seventh gateway. Um, let me talk a little bit about the principles here. When I first, I mentioned this at the beginning, when I first began my work, I talked about self-realization. But I didn't just talk about self-realization. I talked about self-realization and sacred marriage. And as a matter of fact, for me, that sacred marriage had to do with my relationship to the divine feminine that had entered, first had come alive and awake very rapidly in just a short period of time in the early 1992, that it was, yeah. And then uh, it also became part of my relationship to the world altogether. But that quality of self-realization was a major focus of this work for many people and continues to be. At some point, we began 
talking about, well, wait a minute, it's not just self-realization. It doesn't work to say self-realization in sacred marriage or whatever. It's actually self plus other realization or self other realization. The both and of the self and the other at the same time. So um, one of the stories about this and one of the key elements of this part of the process is that this is where a primary part of the awakeness comes into play. And from early in my work, I made a big focus because it, it worked so well for me on the awakening of consciousness. Consciousness itself, in other words, the subjective essence of who we are, our basic sense of awareness and identity, which is different from and can, can be discerned as being different from, in some ways, qualities of energy, of moving spirit or life force. And we've noticed over the years that for some people move into an association with the energy of all existence, where they feel very connected with everything and everyone. But their own sense of identity has not yet awakened deeply. So the waking process is about, as it says here, awakening as the heart of conscious identity in self plus other realization. And part of what is moving to us at this stage is that we're also acknowledging that it's not just realizing the heart in and as oneself in relationship, it's also a deeper and deeper recognition that our shared heart is awakening in and as and through all of us in some ways together, even though different people are at different stages and have different focus at, at any given time. Mm -hmm. So this is a major part of the awakening process. And there are very specific practices that we urge people to attend to, but we don't we don't make it like, well, this is the thing you've got to do first in your awakening work. And in fact, all three of these principles or embodiments take, it's like they take center stage at different times mm -hmm. in people's work to move into a basic awakeness, a basic realization of the heart in this sense, the totality of self and other spirit and matter. And also, their movement into their the stages of their life beyond that initial awakening, which we call a second birth, because it's just the beginning of learning and growing and adapting and integrating all of who you've been with who you now know yourself to be for the first time. Yes. So it's a big deal. Totality identity. Those words mm -hmm. are ring so true and so so wonderful. And just recently, someone who we adore and are working with um, recently spoke to this in her own particular process, realizing that there's a foundation, a fundamental realization of that totality identity that had not been established at any given moment during her process through the years. And so this is very exciting that this profound shift has taken place. And it's also important when you talk about the heart or consciousness or this totality identity that the way we speak about it and the way others speak about it is that you're not existing in the field of it or you're not existing of it, you are existing as it, and that's what you are expressing right. in and as. So, hence, that means no separation. This is a non dual realization where that separation, that sense of the split off place in the spirit matter split that Samuel spoke about earlier, that is, is, is healed. It is, it's married, it comes together in a totality identity. 
so there's no separation so you are existing as the heart yeah. and existing in and as the heart in relationship to others yeah and the initially and in the early stages when you are in effect coming into a fundamental healing of that spirit matter split it can feel like a fusion of these two different principles spirit and matter or consciousness the unconditional subjective sense of, of, of being of self and phenomena all of the objects that not only in ourselves but in the world and in others we are encountering can feel like a fusion has taken place but more and more it becomes apparent that what's actually happened is the fundamental non-difference underneath the apparent differences the fundamental non-separation underneath the obvious separateness and distinctions between us and others which by the way i uh, hate to pop a balloon of a myth here but if you're under the impression that uh, after a, a fundamental and profound awakening then all your relationships are going to be happily ever after that ain't the way it works and we've had plenty of opportunity as have our friends and colleagues and students and aspirants and apprentices in the whole quarter century plus of this work we've had a lot of opportunity to see how different tests and challenges arise and actually which gets to the the the, the third of uh, the gateways in this triad Mutuality can be tested very intensely and sometimes a lot, a lot's at risk and a lot can be lost. Mm -hmm. And that's just uh, the way life goes. It's, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not a kind of cartoon version. Mm -hmm. It's not the Disney version, although if you actually watch Disney, <laughs> where, you know, mother deer get killed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we won't go into that. Oh, so, no, flashback. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Samuel. I think we could move on to yes, the down do gateway. So this is very important also, actually, because we're talking about waking and we're talking about down. So some people say, well, first you have to wake up and then you wake down. But it doesn't really show up mm -hmm. that way most often for people. It's a simultaneously waking up and waking down. It is a, an inhabiting of your precious body, mind, every part of who you are cellularly realized as the heart consciousness, as that totality identity. So you drop down into form. You embrace form on a level that you've never been able to embrace form or matter, if you will, before. And this is the down piece. This is one aspect of the down piece. Another aspect of the down piece is the shadow material, the emotional being, some of the broken zones we call um, wounds in relationship, broken off zones, perhaps. This is all part of the down gateway. And sometimes it's a little difficult territory to traverse, obviously, going into some of the shadow material, but it's really, really important. A lot of times we'll suggest to people that when they're feeling like they might need a different kind of assistance with some of these broken zones or pieces mm -hmm. of their psyche that might have been wounded, we suggest a body-based therapy. We're not doing therapy. We're not therapists per se. We have a very particular articulation of waking down and mutuality. A skilled therapist, body-based therapist, like somatic experiencing, could serve you at any given point along the way. And again, discern what works for you and what doesn't work for you. If, you, if you're feeling like you want to go that direction as well as working on your spiritual practice in waking down then find the right person there's many people out there who are wonderful and skilled and it can actually dovetail into this work as well yeah and uh, it's worth emphasizing and this will be 
I think more, we'll flesh this out a little bit more when we get to the 11th gateway, which is recognizing the degree to which we go into and, and, and listen to as teachers and the degree to which people talk about and express uh, their deeper, darker shadow feelings, the parts of themselves that are that feel cut off, uh, the identity fragments that when they f- drop into those zones, they feel very threatened and fearful and they're not at all comfortable. It's not how they want to live, not how they want to know themselves, not how they want others to see them. So we don't shy away from all that because all of that is integrated. Enormous energy, attention, and awareness are liberated by those parts, as one woman wrote after her awakening process had matured to a great degree. She said, I feel like the broken parts of myself are like black sheep that have been welcomed back into the barn. That's a part of the process. It's not the same. It doesn't have the same purpose or intention as psychotherapy. And it's very important for us to state unequivocally and live this way, be compliant with this. Uh, We don't do therapy and we do indeed recommend it uh, a lot. And moreover, we both have made use of therapy a couple of decades into our awakened lives, as well as at various other moments, uh, while being teachers and helping other people. It's just a natural part of the repertoire of skills that we can bring into our lives to help us integrate more fully. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we talked about that. Let me say a couple of other things. Just to summarize, there are two parts of this down. One is that deep emotional work, the exposure to, you know, all all those parts of us get this green light as the sun of the heart nature is shining more prominently, its light falls on everything, so to speak, good way to put it. The other part is this energetic dropping. And again, it's not that everybody has this experience, but actually that word dropping was pioneered or first used by people who were going through the process and they would say to one another and to me, oh, so-and-so is really dropping. There's that quality of Mm -hmm. a landing that is fundamentally energetic uh, and emotional as well, but it's not the same as the the shadow integration part of the down work. It's a couple of funny stories uh, about this. Well, one's not exactly so funny but it was a woman who we were working with she was a grandmother she had been around a lot of blocks she'd done a lot of um 12-step recovery work and had moved on and had achieved a very profound realization of consciousness or the essential self capital s uh through her uh, work uh, in another tradition or school And she found herself motivated to find out what our work was about. And so both Linda and I had been working with her and we were sitting in a group setting one day and she was clearly clicking into this process. The stages of it were obviously uh, getting activated in her. Percolating. Percolating, very much (laughs) percolating. And, And at this particular point, she was, I remember she was kind of frustrated and uncomfortable and and struggling with the the both and the the quality of wound wellness and so forth we weren't using that exact language at the time but certainly getting used to the idea that this wasn't just about identifying with a pure consciousness and just abiding as that that there was a coming back into life that was a it wasn't going away from that consciousness, it was moving into a paradoxical condition at both and quality. And so we're sitting there and I forget what we were talking about. We were talking about with someone else, but as I recall, she actually interrupted. Again, she was frustrated that day. So she said, you mean the paradox doesn't get resolved? 
And I looked at her and I could feel Linda also, we were both teaching that day. We were both looking at her. We could tell this was a very pregnant moment for her. <laughs> Probably a good word for it. <laughs> and I said, exactly. And trading notes later, we both had the, the perception, you know, a kind of uh, a sensing of her as just going, thunk. <laughs> Just landing Literally. back in her own body, that same body that had gone through all that hardship and pain of addiction and had won her sobriety and was a great sponsor and counselor to others and who had clarified this pure, unconditional awareness <laughs> and consciousness and knew how to abide as that. She was getting what we felt was, in effect, the heart's own message to her. That's not enough. There's more. Come back to life. Yes. That was an initiation in itself. That was her. an initiation. And I was sitting right next to her, and uh, literally, physically, you could see her body land more fully in her zafu. She was on the floor. Yeah. I was on the floor, and it was like she just went, oh. Yeah. It was wonderful and brilliant. So that's an energetic quality of coming down. Mm -hmm. And literally there's a shift and we use that phrase, the center of gravity of your identity comes down from the head into the heart and the whole body mm -hmm. in such a way that you didn't know was possible until it happens. And it may be something, a phrase that came up with, people came up with earlier also that they started sharing with me and, and others, uh, some people ooze. So it's nothing like that kind of right. incident that that woman went through. Right. But it's nonetheless quite profound. And at some point it dawns on them, wow, I really have shifted here. Yes. So the other story, just quickly. Um, and it was, I think it was a couple of years before then, but both of these events were actually back in the 90s, the mid 90s or later 90s. And this was uh, with, uh, again, it was another gathering. And um, I think we were both teaching there, but I don't know if you had become a teacher yet. I can't remember. Anyway, um, there were maybe five or 10 other people in the room. So it certainly wasn't a private conversation. And there was this woman who had recently gone through this awakening by waking down in mutuality. And she was uh, also obviously kind of uncomfortable as I was talking with someone else. Uh, and at some point, she blurted out what was going on with her. And I was a little surprised because she's a very reserved, kind of an elegant, very reserved person. I don't mean elegant in a non-earthy way. She's, she's real, but she's not all over everyone and she's not constantly talking about her most intimate secrets and on this occasion she couldn't help but evidently and she said you know uh i'm gonna tell you and everybody something that i wouldn't normally dream of talking about in a group uh, or even privately to most people but the fact is all my life i've been frigid i've never been able to have an orgasm but now, since my awakening, she said, I'm having orgasms all the time. I don't even necessarily need to be <laughs> stimulated. And she said, what is going on? And I sat there and I'm trying to you know, figure out what's the best way to say something here. And what came to me to say was, was this. I said, well, so-and-so. Maybe it couldn't come until you got here. <laughs> Meaning there was a necessity in your being to land, to wake down, yes. to come back into embodiment. And for whatever reason, you perhaps because of your own broken zones and so forth, I don't remember the elaboration we did on that. We all had a laugh, including her. She loved it. She loved it. <laughs> Um, but for whatever reason, that 
quality of your sexual participation was not open to you until you could be that much more here mm -hmm. as a whole human, female, woman, whole bodily participating. Mm -hmm. So this is not automatically a ticket to more and better orgasms, <laughs> but um, at least one person did have that, <laughs> that, that benefit from the work. Yeah, thank you, Samuel. Let's move on to mutuality. Yes, indeed. So this a couple of things the about ninth the gateway. ninth gateway. Yes, so mutuality. Um, before I began my quest for spiritual enlightenment or awakening, before I was even attracted to that, uh, one of the things I learned, this was when I was, I guess, a sophomore at Harvard, which is where I went to school. Uh, a mentor there, uh, a teaching assistant, introduced me to the work of Martin Buber. Martin Buber was uh, a German Jew in the early part of the 20th century who had been a mystical prodigy, and many people came to him. Uh, and one day he was in a kind of a mystic state, absorbed in ecstasy. And a young man came to consult with him, and Uber, I guess, his assistant turned the young man away because Uber was in this ecstatic state. And then two weeks later, he found out that the young man had died at the beginning of World War I. And that had a shocking effect on him. I don't know if it led him to renounce all mystic states, but he realized he had not been there for the other. He was so absorbed in himself and his communion with the divine light or whatever, however he would have described that, that he missed the opportunity. An other had come to him who wanted his help, he didn't see him, and within two weeks, the man was dead. That led Buber to his life of focusing on the reality of the other. And his masterwork was called I and Thou. Uh, and I and You. And he, he goes into such depth and detail about the reality of the other and the reality of the between, the tissue between us and the other. It's not physical, but is profoundly real, spiritual, emotional, total, energetic. And so I was deeply moved by those parts of, of by, by Buber's work in that sense. And though I never made a big deal of studying it further later on in my life, it always stuck with me. So much so that then when the time came for me to teach, I knew mutuality was going to be a major part of the work. Initially, when we started calling the work by the name Waking Down, we referred to mutuality as part of it. At a certain point, I remember saying, this is in the early 2000s, I remember saying to Linda and the other teachers at that time, we're not doing justice to the total work. Mutuality isn't just a side principle. Oh, by the way, it's Waking Down, and there's this mutuality aspect. The work is waking down in mutuality. Self plus other realization was a term we later came to. And mutuality, if waking is what takes you principally into the self-realization or the self-aspect of self plus other realization, mutuality takes you principally into other, the other realization part of self plus other realization. So. What else shall we say about that? Well, you pretty much uh, spoke to the, the self and other, mm -hmm. which is really important. And pretty much all through these gateways, we've been talking a lot right. about mutuality. I don't think we need to go on too much more with this particular gateway because it is so interwoven yeah. with all of the gateways and it is so <laughs> interwoven not only in ourselves, but in our relationships to others. There is one quick story I'll, I'll tell about a woman who was on our heart team many years ago, and I was doing a session with her, and we were talking about mutuality, 
And she says, well, I'm realizing that mutuality for me just doesn't mean relational mutuality with others. I'm very good at that, but I'm realizing that in my practice, in my process, I am literally having mutuality with myself. And something just clicked for me when she said that. She went on to explain that as she was evolving and realizing and growing, she was noticing that she was really paying attention to all parts of herself. She was really seeing that her recognition process and her discernment was kicking in on a high gear in a, in a different way than it ever had been before. And she was noticing that the way that she was related to that had an aspect of mutuality with self. And so it was really intriguing. We, we use that now a lot of times with people who will say to us, well, mutuality, gosh, do I have to re constantly relate? Do I ha Does that mean I have to get out and just be with people all the time and, and get more friends or be closer to my family or whatever it might mean for you? Only if that is what is singing to your heart. Right. Find the ways and means that mutuality shows up for you. What works for you? That doesn't mean that you have to go out and be what we would call a mutual light, where you're constantly engaging. Sometimes that literally takes you out of noticing self, yeah. takes you out of some of the aha moments because you're so engaged with relationship that you're kind of distracting yourself from yourself. So it's important to really be noticing all of these things mm -hmm. all along the way. Yeah, and uh, there are a couple of other pieces of the mutuality process that really would be worth mentioning briefly here. One is we discovered early on, um, one of the other teachers we were, we were colleagues with <clears throat> eventually insisted that I had come up with this, but I was sure that she had. Um, the principle that, or the axiom that, Wounds created in a relationship can only be fully healed in a relationship. People can go through a healing process independently on their own, so to speak, uh, in the same way that people can move into forgiveness of another um, because they're, uh, they know they've got to do it. They don't want to carry whatever the distress is. But what we've seen is that this mutuality principle you know, it is deeply expressive of our primal interconnectedness and that any spiritual or personal growth process that doesn't take it into account is actually leaving out a whole big piece of our reality. Yeah. And the other thing that I'll, I'll mention just briefly is People can get into, I think you were talking about, a kind of a mutuality fundamentalism where they feel like they've got to be out there relating all the time and anybody who's not doing that isn't in mutuality, quote unquote. You know, all practices and paths and communities wind up having their, we call it street dharma or street teaching, the not yet very well fully understood uh, understanding of such principles. But one of, one of the uh, key things that people can move into is a quality of mutuality that's about relatedness, mm -hmm. not so much relationship. And as people mature and advance, they can find themselves moving into a kind of seclusion or you know, relative disinclination to be so related. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is... At that point, they are so deeply established in relatedness that that is the way their mutuality practice is functioning in their maturity. But they will have gone through a lot of learning the lessons of mutuality in relationship for a long time before that. Mm. Yes. So that's the third triad, three principles or embodiments, waking down and mutuality and now we come to the uh, end of our last series of gateways here. So 
This is the fourth triad, green. Green meaning green light, among other things, giving movement and motion and development. Tenth gateway is daring, choosing your autonomous way, living and speaking in integrity. Eleventh gateway is recognizing, green lighting, six-step recognition yoga, and the four R's. The twelfth gateway is holding, embracing what is, and learning how to be a blessing heart presence to all. Yeah, so there's not a, a whole lot to say about this. It's pretty self-explanatory, but one quick story. Well, for daring in particular. For daring, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I was wanting to refer to. Not all three, but mm -hmm. for daring in particular. Um, I remember, gosh, years ago, I was going through something and um, having a difficult time, and I realized that as I was speaking my truth, it wasn't really landing for some. And this is the messiness of mutuality. Mutuality can be messy. We just spoke about, about mutuality. But the daring to be able to step up and speak your truth is really, really important. So the phrase that came to me was living your truth is not a popularity contest. That means that as you dare to speak your truth and to live your truth, it may not be the other's truth. And so that can create some conflict sometimes. On the other hand, it can also create a coming together and a meeting and a, and a deep being met by the other when your truth resonates deeply with the other. So once again, we are divinely human beings and some of the limitations that we experience as being human beings, but simultaneously divinity along with that, is that we are going to hit up against sometimes that may not resonate with others. And that's okay. And as long as you're communicating and honoring the other for the logic of their being, whether you agree or disagree or understand just honoring the fact that they are living their truth as best they can life becomes a bit more easier i think and joyful because you can have the open compassionate heart right and uh, again well let's let's frame the question why is daring as important a principle here as say waking <clears throat> why, why do we give it equal billing with the other uh, gateway names here? And it's because it's so fundamental to the heart, capital H, your greater nature, your particular expression of the totality identity that is everyone and everything. It's so central to that heart nature finding its way as you to be here and to express its gifts through your unique potentials. And so there's a lot of, I discovered this very early on, a lot of breaking of taboos that make this heart realized life not only possible, but necessary and that make further changes and growth inevitable not just, well, maybe I'll grow a little bit more, maybe I'd like to do this or that, but rather you can't avoid it. And I remember early on, not long after my awakening, I had a mentor who had been helping me. And uh, I said to him one day, because I was contemplating announcing that I had become a teacher. And I knew that politically from the spiritual world that I had come from, this would be frowned on to put it mildly, ridiculed to put it mildly. And I, there are many people right in the area where I was living who are still very much of that frame of mind. And I said to uh, this mentor, I said, you know, uh, I feel like I'm breaking taboos every day. And he said to me, well, uh, you know what a taboo is? A taboo is a ceiling that initiates breakthrough. And so that is the function of these 
these feelings of being up against a pressure of, you know, do I dare say this or do I do make that choice? Do I dare make that choice? And what are people going to think? What are people going to feel? Family, yes. Former close spiritual companions also. And that's part of the risk of daring, but it yields great rewards, not necessarily the rewards you were looking for. The big reward is that being true to yourself, that deep listening and knowing I have to come forward in this or that way. Or it may be a kind of a daring that doesn't come forward and we'll get to that with the 12th and final gateway. Yeah, the daring shows up also in making choices in your life whether it be choices about relationships, choices about work situations, choices about what kind of practice and discipline spiritually that you want to dive into. So find your pacing and rhythm all along the way with all of that mm -hmm. as well. And dare, dare to show up. <laughs> so we've got recognizing as our next gateway, the 11th gateway, and that is recognizing green lighting, six-step recognition yoga, and the four R's. Now, there's a lot to cover here, so we're going to quickly go through this. And then the last one is holding, and we are kind of running out of time here. We've got till five after, so. Yeah, to five after? Yeah. Okay. So recognizing the six-step recognition yoga and green lighting, this is another piece of the teaching that is really important and i think once again as we were going through some of the other gateways we are dipping in a bit about recognizing noticing things that are showing up in your life noticing places where you maybe need to dare to step into in a different way you know take that cliff jump so to speak so six step recognition yoga i'll start there the six steps are see it, feel it, live it, be it, transcend it in place, and speak it all along the way at appropriate moments. Now, without going into the history of this too much, this was something that just naturally was revealed to me when I was going through something difficult many years ago. And I was struggling with a particular relationship, trying to figure out how to communicate to this person how to heal some of the conflict that we had with each other and coming out of a restful afternoon I was kind of sad and feeling down so I took a little nap and when I woke up as I was coming out these six steps or five steps I should say because Samuel actually added the speak it along the way step as I reported this to him it actually helped me ground and be more centered in myself as I allowed the truth of each one of those steps to come in and to help me integrate and realize that it's not about me trying to change anyone. It's really about myself and my relationship to the situation. So the seeing it is identifying what the issue is. The feeling it is allowing yourself to drop deeply into the the visceral feeling, the emotional feeling sense of what it is, and allowing yourself to live that, you know, in the third step, live it and be that, drop deeply into it so much that you can express it, animate it in the living of it. If it means going to an individual and having a conversation, dare to do that as best you can. If it means holding yourself and investigating it a little more and maybe getting some of that energy out by screaming in your car or beating a pillow or writing or doing an artistic expression or talking to someone else you know these are all ways of living it and as you drop deeply into that you become in a mysterious way you become that issue you allow that issue to show all of the sides that it needs to show you so that you can actually embody it fully. And in that living and being it, there's a, a 
profound transcending of the effects of the issue. Now I'm speaking about a difficult issue, but this also works for bolstering and accentuating joyful, happy moments as well. Or ideas that you're percolating about, you know, just going, hmm, maybe I wanna try this or try that. Six step recognition yoga can actually help you come to terms with maybe the next step to take in bolstering this joy or this project or this expression that might be arising in your being. For me, as I was considering this, after this came through for me years ago, that particular issue just did not have what I called the chokehold any longer. That chokehold was released fully and I transcended the effect of the issue. And then as I was so excited, as I ran into the kitchen to talk to Samuel about it, and I truly felt transformed. I, I told him this, the five steps and he said, can, that's brilliant, it's amazing that you had that reverie and can I add a six step, speak it along the way. And that absolutely resonated with me. And that also goes to the living of it because that's the animation that's bringing it into action. Mm -hmm. So that's six step recognition yoga. So as you're investigating, as you're recognizing, as you're noticing even the subtle things, even the subtle shifts and changes, the, the term green lighting comes into play as well. You can speak a little bit to that if you'd like, but green lighting all of these places in six step recognition yoga helps you welcome the aha moments. It helps you welcome the recognition process that naturally you are engaged in and as. A lot of times people say, well, is this a practice that I have to do like a rote practice? You can do it as a practice, but quite often I've found through the years that someone who's dealing with a difficult situation in particular, might say, and I did this and I did that. And I'll say, you just spoke to six step recognition yoga. And that's why you are able to rest more fully in yourself and see that the effects of the situation just don't have the same power over you any longer. And that's also the green lighting, the welcoming, the opening up the possibilities of all parts of yourself once again to learn to notice to recognize and then to heal and to transcend any effect that might be difficult yeah and uh i think that was the fastest i've ever done six step recognition yoga <laughs> well thank you uh, we're, 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 crystallization yeah thanks thank you for crystallizing it in general uh, let's acknowledge there's a lot of information here. Yeah. Um, this kind of teaching can be spread out. We've, we could do this over 13 sessions, one, you know, a substantial session per uh, gateway plus an introduction. But uh, I think we're covering some of the basics, some of the essentials here. And again, in this heart context, so just quickly, uh, a little bit of um, first about six-step recognition yoga. When Linda came to me, and now this is 1998, I'm pretty sure, uh, and I had been teaching openly since mid-1993, and I'd written at this point a couple of books. And, and you know, I was very well aware of the sophistication of this whole approach. You know, it's nuanced. It takes, it takes growing into, and it takes a lot of discernment and discriminative intelligence. And it can be expressed at length and in sophisticated technical, spiritual language and so forth. And I have a tendency to do that a lot. Um, as you may know, <laughs> I don't know. I cracked up when Linda brought this to me because those five steps and then I chipped in the six, which is the mutuality piece. But these are all, except for transcend, they're all one syllable words. See, feel, live, be, 
You know, I mean, it could not be simpler. And uh, it dawned on me that it was, and, and it, you see, it came through, and Linda's very visual also, she's an artist. It came through, you know, in images for her. Yes, billboards in my mind's eye. Yeah. Those words just. Yeah. And I just recognize this uh, in the language we're speaking here. This was a direct revelation of the heart and literally of the heart of this a major aspect of this process. She had expressed the recognition process. We later came to call it six step recognition yoga uh, in an utterly unique way, far more succinct and easy to grab hold of than anything I was able to come up with before or since. And I haven't even tried, it does it so well. So the other thing I wanna mention and I'm very grateful for that, obviously. The other thing I want to mention is green lighting. Uh, very briefly, where this came from is the very first year of my work, 1993. I'd be doing these long sessions with people, taking them through a whole process together. And at some point, I would start talking to them about self-acceptance. And this happened enough times that I began to notice a pattern they'd get more and more excited and turned on and activated in a sense of hope and all this until I got to that point. And then when I started talking about self-acceptance, it's as if somebody just took the air right out of their tires. It's like their, their gaze went dull, their faces went gray. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a bit, but not too much. And I realized what, what self-acceptance meant to them was resignation. And so I used green lighting, which I was reading about in the entertainment magazines, as a Hollywood term. This is what producers do when they basically say, go with this and change things with it. So there's a paradox here. By green lighting, even these really difficult negative qualities in ourselves, in the context of all of these other gateways and principles and understandings and adaptations and fundamental practices and embodiments in that context especially giving these qualities in yourself a green light to be what they are so that you can not only see it and feel it but live it and be it become it even feel like you're reduced to it very daring kind of practice nonetheless what winds up happening is great gifts are realized out of that you integrate these parts through that transcending in place, through that transcending of the effects. So I just wanted to say those things. I'll just mention briefly, uh, all of this recognizing is activating the dimension of our mind that can be called discriminative intelligence. It's a deeper part of mind than just our thinking. It's our discernment. <laughs> There's a man who came to us also back in those early days in the 90s, who was an older fellow at that point, younger than I am now, but back then he seemed quite a bit older. <laughs> and he was very intelligent, but he kept saying, I don't get the teachings. I just don't understand it. And then at some point he said to me one day, he said, Samuel, is, is what you mean by discriminative intelligence is that just common sense? And I said, yeah, whole being common sense. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about here. It's a quality of whole being common sense. And I'm just going to quickly point out, so we are needing to come to our end here, mm -hmm. that the four R's is what happens when you've been there and done that with feeling, seeing, living, being, transcending in place, speaking along the way, let's say with some major issue. You've been there and done that seemingly lots and lots of times. And you get the feeling like there's nothing being gained by going through living it and being it all over again. And so in order to get to recognition and the release that it brings, the release of the chokehold is a good, beautiful image of it. What happens then is that and this is what we mean, that recognition and release are the first two R's. The second are reconfiguration and regeneration. You reconfigure your whole relationship to that issue, not by going into it and feeling it so fully all over again, 
and being it and living it. But by choosing very early there, you see it, maybe you feel it a bit, you immediately choose conscious, skillful will, as Linda's phrase for it. You choose to reconfigure how you are related to it. You do something different. So instead of going back into it, you decide, no, I'm going to just choose this way of acting here instead. For me, an early one was doubt. And someone once said to me, after I'd been through it a zillion times, every time you go there, I feel like you're cutting me adrift. And I said, in that case, I'm burning the bridge and that playground of doubt as well. And I never gave into it again in that way. So this is our 11th gateway, recognizing, and those are the four R's, because what happens then is after you've practiced reconfiguring a bit, you discover it's natural to you. You don't have yes. to try. You just don't go there anymore. Yes, and as we mentioned earlier, this is a, a bodily process of reconfiguration. So the, the cells literally are vibrating to an, a different kind of communication and yeah. teaching and yeah. being. So our final gateway is holding. And that includes persevering. And it includes also not only being with the both ends and the, 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 the oppositions and the contradictions of life and in yourself and in others, but it also includes something different from daring to speak, to live your truth outwardly to say the hard thing. It includes a point at which you realize, wait a minute, maybe I don't need to say that now. Maybe I just need to hold that person, how I feel about it, how they feel about whatever is going on, and just not avoid it, not spiritually bypass it, but be able to allow mm -hmm. the opposites and oppositions, I'm trying to get my other hand into the, <laughs> the opposites and the oppositions, to be the way they are. Yeah. And there's in holding, there's a lot of persevering. There's a lot of loneliness, even though you may have wonderful relationships. There's there's a, a charting out that much more of living your truth and giving room for the world in some ways and situations to not be permeable to the changes you want to bring about, at least not just yet. Yeah, so embrace, kind of basic piece of it. Yeah, embracing the opposites. There was a phrase back in the day, tantric tension, holding the tantric tension, which what we mean by tantric is is embracing the opposites, is being able to not only embrace the opposites that are paradoxically so opposite from each other that how could you get through that, but holding the tension of recognizing that you have to yeah. to do that yeah. and to do it for self and to also do it with others holding others is a very important aspect of this gateway not yeah. just holding your own personal tantric tension but when appropriate hold others deeply in the heart mm -hmm. and hold others deeply from a loving compassionate place as best you can when appropriate yeah so that's our 12th gateway. That's the fourth triad for movements and prompts. Green, because it's a lot of green lighting in here. Mm -hmm. And so this then brings us to the close here. And uh, you know, once again, we've gone through this whole sequence here. If you look at them in order, the sunrise in blue and the rot, the mystery, and then in purple, Listening, waking, I'm oh, sorry, listening, transmission, and initiation. And then uh, red, the third triad, waking down and mutuality. And green, the fourth, daring, recognizing, holding. Mm -hmm. So a lot of information, uh, only a tidbit of what's here to be discovered. Uh, after we're done, uh, if you want to stay on the line and you've been here, we'll, we'll end in just a moment formally, and then we'll take a minute to just acknowledge each of you by name who's been on the call with us live. We really feel and appreciate yes. your presence. 
Thank means you. a lot to us that you've been here. Uh, thank you so much. This has just been yeah. so rich and wonderful. Why don't you tell people how to get to our website and what yeah, and our, next step with them? Our website is samuelandlinda.com. Uh, a next step might be the book Healing the Spirit Matter Split. It's a little old, either in the book form or the audio book. Um, but it's a good uh, unpacking mm -hmm. and a kind of conversational dialogue uh, of waking down and mutuality and how it works. Uh, there are many other courses that are available. Linda and I also do private session work, and we offer live courses frequently. Uh, I do live sittings for the gazing and the meditating every day on Facebook. Um, so there are a lot of ways to get in touch with us. Many people tell us they've watched a lot of the uh, videos on YouTube, most of which are a bit older. Uh, but there's plenty going on here, and we invite you to plug in and get in touch with us. You can write to info at samuelandlinda.com, uh, and we will be very happy to respond and yes. to be in touch with you. Yes. We just completed an online course, Maximizing Joy, which is just such a rich, wonderful expression that uh, we want to encourage everyone to plug into yeah. that as well. Yeah. Plus on that one, we had nine other teachers outside our particular school completely, including Ken Wilbur and Rick Hansen and Mirabai Starr and, and others who were part of that. So that's mm, yes. one of the other things we offer. Let's, well, say, yeah. let's just say a, a couple of words to kind of yes. further wrap this up. Um, part of what's been so exciting for us about this stage of our lives, our work, our understanding of this process is that this is our shared heart awakening. And waking down in mutuality, as we said at the beginning, is one of the heart's primary ways of coming alive and awake as us human beings with all our faults and failings and limitations and so forth. And it encompasses them and breathes life into our totality, mm. our totality identity. Not so that then we're distancing ourselves from our ego self, but rather including it mm. in the greater reality of who we are and what life is. That's right. Part so, of our whole being. Part of our whole being. So yeah. it's been our great pleasure uh, to present this to you whenever you're seeing this. And it will be present on various other websites as well as here on my timeline. Mm -hmm. um, please feel free also to refer others to this uh, for you know a, a good basic orientation yes. to what this work is about. Yeah, the audio and visual will be available on on our website yes shortly yeah, yeah soon sure. and i just also want to thank you my love for your brilliance for revealing the teaching um for changing my life completely <laughs> <laughs> and i'm thrilled to be with all of you tonight thank you so much for being with us and contributing your presence yes to this and, presentation and you whoever you are wherever you are and whenever you are partaking of this thank you so much for your attention and we hope at least this has contributed something to your life of value and we welcome you to find out what else is available uh, if you're so moved and i of course want to thank you my love thank you. who embodies the heart as conscious love and trust like nobody else I know on the planet and who has changed my life utterly and for the better. Thank you. So, thank you all so very much. Yes. Blessings, on, Blessings your journey, on your journey, no matter where it leads you, we Indeed. like to say. All right. Be well. <laughs>